Welcome to this next video, which is in the playlist Downstream Processing in the Pharmaceutical Industry. And specifically in this video, I'm going to talk about the crystallization for the downstream processing proteins. And as you can see in this first slide, these are the crystals that you might know, which you have on the outside of your window when it's a frosty day. But let's talk about how we can use crystallization for purification. And the first question that you might ask yourself is why would we use crystallization? Well, typically chromatography, and I've done a quite a few videos on chromatography, is used uh, for purification and separation. However, this is very high resin and buffer cost, so the operation costs are quite high. And usually you're not just limited to one type of chromatography, this often involves a multi-step process. So it can be quite cumbersome as well. However, if you use something like crystallization, one of the big advantages is that we know we can get very high purity with the system. Plus, because you're working with solid uh, forms of it, we know that we can also get very stable systems. Now, some of the problems that we might have with this is that we know that there is a tendency to move towards continuous operation because it dramatically reduces the operating costs and is also better for working with higher volumes. So continuous crystallization is something that's not employed that much. All of this is typically done in batch. But in this video, we'll give you a couple of examples of how we can do this continuously, specifically for proteins, because the process is much better understood for smaller molecules. Now first, you need to have a bit of understanding of the process. And in the next slide, I will talk about the supersaturation level. Um, so if you look at this kind of diagram, we know that we don't want to be all the way well and either completely at the left. So if it's soluble, then we don't have enough material, so we're below the supersaturation state. But we don't want to be all the way on the right as well uh, in the precipitation state, uh, because in that case you start to form amorphous structures. So obviously that's not in line with um, the fact that we want to have really high purity materials. So there's a couple of other ranges then. So we look at a metastable state where you might be able to form uh, crystals and then we have a secondary and primary nucleation state. So in order to understand what this is and where we need to be when we look at this, let's talk about what supersaturation is and that will be in the next slide. So to understand what supersaturation is, so to look at that kind of from the metastable to primary and secondary nucleation state, I looked at the IUPAC definition of supersaturation in chemistry. So that's an unstable system which has a greater concentration of a material in solution than would exist in an equilibrium, and this is said to be supersaturated. So how can you achieve this? And actually there's quite a few uh, examples that you can find of where supersaturation occurs in, in nature, even though it said this is metastable, this is very common. So if you would want to make this, you can take a saturated satolu uh, solution. So you can heat it up because generally for most compounds, not for all of them, bear this in mind, your saturation will increase with temperature. So either you can increase the temperature or you can add some salts to it and then you can slowly cool it down and then you get uh, to the solution which is super saturated. So it actually contains more of the material uh, than you would have in an equilibrium, and this is how you would achieve this. So as I mentioned before, uh, this is a metastable state. So what this means is that inherently it's unstable and it readily crystallizes when it's disturbed or when a seeding agent is added. And this is important for when we look at our own crystallization process, so when we look at, for instance, primary or secondary nucleation. Now this supersaturated state, it really depends on the pH you're working with, it depends on, on the temperature, salts and seed crystals that you might add. So you need to have an understanding of the full system to, to know, and you need to know the full phase gray diagram to see where you're actually working. So now we looked at the conditions that you need for crystallization. Let's have a look at two types of reactors that are commonly used in continuous crystallization. And the most common one is the first one I present, which is a tubular crystallizer. So if you look at the image, you can see the top one is actually the one I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, but the bottom one is a tubular crystallizer, where you have a tube kind of like of system. Now this is very uh, preferred when you have a high yield, and particularly for a short residence time. Um, so what you can do with these crystallizers, you can operate them under relatively mild conditions, which is important. And typically, it operates on the laminar flow. 
um, so nothing too high because that might uh, disturb your crystallization. Uh, and you will see this is very different compared to the reactor that we'll look at in the next slide. Uh, mixing is very important because you can imagine that easily clogging can occur, especially when you start to form bigger crystals within the tubes, so you might want to avoid this. And typically there's three types of flow systems you can work with. You can work with normal plug flow, with something which is also called slug flow, or you have oscillatory baffled systems. Um, so different operation modes that you can use. Now, typically, as this kind of works with a type of tube, uh, if you were to want to scale this up, uh, you would do this with parallel reactors. So scaling it up just means that you have more segments um, that you would have in parallel. Now, this is specifically, as I mentioned, for a higher yield and a shorter residence time. And I'll compare this to the other reactors uh, that can be used in the next slide. So bearing in mind, all of this is specifically done for proteins and not for small molecules. Now the MSMPR crystallizer, I know this is quite a bit of a mouthful. So this stands for Mixed Suspension Mixed Product Removal Crystallizer. Uh, an example uh, over here, which you can find, you can look into literature to see how this works, uh, it used a cool tubular bypass system. Now, in essence, this is not so much different from a CSTR. Here you can see you have like uh, some kind of mixing that occurs, so you use like an, an impeller. Uh, and this one is particularly uh, better suited towards the longer residence time, unlike a tubular reactor. Now, and the, the reason for that is that you can actually achieve vigorous mixing because you have an impeller now. Uh, and that means that you can also prevent some of that clogging uh, that you would get in the other reactor. Uh, but one really big disadvantage here, if you look at because of the shape of a tubular reactor, you have a much higher surface to volume ratio, which is inherently better for the yield. Um, so this particular one has a smaller surface to volume uh, ratio, which means that typically your yield tends to be somewhat lower. And that's a bit of a disadvantage uh, for what you're looking at here. So two types of very different crystallizers, but the advantage is that you can operate both of them under continuous uh, conditions, which is definitely a benefit if you're looking to scale this up. So let's have a look at some of the challenges that you might encounter in this process, because crystallization is definitely not as commonly employed as, for instance, chromatography in downstream processing. And so you will see this is also only a relatively short video, uh, because there's definitely much more batch examples. Uh, and in order to, to really, for this to work for proteins, we need to move away from this batch process. Another big problem here is that the process in proteins compared to small molecules, the crystallization goes at a much slower rate. And that brings with some of the inherent problems that you see with clogging um, and the higher residence time, which we can't traditionally accommodate so well uh, with these tubular crystallizers. And besides that, uh, here you can see some crystals of lysozyme, which is like your typical model protein. The process for many proteins is actually not that well understood. Um, so you will really need to, to have like a phase diagram in order to work out what you need. Another thing, if you then have like model systems that you want to try different designs with, like for instance lysozyme, people don't often take contaminants into account. Uh, and that's a really big problem that you encounter in any type of process. So in essence, we need better model systems in order to test this um, for our proteins. Another big disadvantage compared to batch is the yield itself. So tubular crystallizers are much more often employed, but also typically lead to lower yield. Uh, and we can improve this uh, if we add, for instance, recycling streams, or we can integrate other um, techniques such as additional filters or membranes, which can remove some of the contaminants that you inherently get in the process. So this is a very short summary. And all what you should take from this is that crystallization is a really important step. So we mainly know this from when we want to determine crystal structure if we work in a lab, uh, where we only, let's say, we only really need one crystal. Uh, whenever, but when you're working in the pharmaceutical industry, you're looking at a very high yield process that you need. And this is inherently where this crystallization is not as well implemented yet as chromatography. So we tend to lose a lot more of the material. So if we can get a better understanding of um, the process for proteins, how this works, and particularly how we can deal with some of the contaminants, then I will predict 
that this process will take off in terms of the downstream processing because of the very high purity that you can achieve, which you can't necessarily get in chromatography. Thanks for watching, and if you do want to see more videos on uh, downstream processing in the pharmaceutical industry, then do have a look at this playlist.